Um, hi, everyone, and welcome um, to this journal club. Um, I'm Tanina Arab, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Dr. Witwer Lab. And I'm going to co-host this uh, session with uh, Bianca Bashan in our lab as well. So today we have actually the honor to have multiple authors from the paper that would be discussed and presented. Uh, we have uh, uh, Hamari Delaram, Danilo uh, Madinovici, and then uh, we have Natasha Zar uh, Zarovny and Edis Puzash, their mentors. So I'm just going to hand it over to you, Natasha, uh, to give us some words of introduction uh, on Delaram and Danilo. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Nina. Uh, well, this is more uh, of a greeting than introduction. I, I think that they will talk for, for themselves. Um, I have to start with the due thanks to the whole team, Kenneth and the team that uh, are managing this uh, uh, journal club session. Uh, for this very much appreciated uh, invitation that uh, draws the attention to this work. And I think that this attention is timely and it's also uh, deserved because this work tackles uh, an argument that is very dear to me personally, but it's also considered very important by many in the field uh, for realistic transition of uh, EV technologies to, um, let's say, meaningful clinical and eventually also commercial grade diagnostics, which is, um, I would sum it, as, uh, sum it up as um, stoichiometric issues that um, determine detection of rare EVs and EV-borne markers in blood. Uh, this, um, th this problem, this issue, has been looked by many from different angles, uh, and there are more fancy ways to resolve this, for example, by very, very cool analytical technologies. But we in Hansa Biomed and later in Exosomics, we, we've been looking at this from a different perspective, uh, which was a pre-analytical one. And, um, uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, like, as I said, let's fancy it's small panel, but uh, we have to consider that uh, preanalytics is the cause of many, if not most, errors in diagnostic flows, okay? And it was also in, in, in our uh, personal uh, experience, uh, the cause of, uh, it, it was kind of a showstopper for many EV diagnostic development pipelines, okay? So uh, I'm actually very glad that in their long and winding road uh, uh, along their training and PhD projects, uh, Danilo and Della stumbled over not only the problem, but also some solutions. And it's very nice. These solutions actually come as a very universally robust, transferable, and truly reusable. So this is something that can be implemented not only by EV researchers, but also by, you know, clinical chemistry. And this is also why this work has been published in Clinical Chemistry Journal. Uh, so this is an introduction on, on what it focus on. But I would also have to, I, I have to say a, another thing that uh, Della and uh, Danilo, started and continued their training within uh, an ITN program that to my knowledge was the first, one of the first projects in Europe that was funded on EVs. And it was the first training program that actually gathered some really cool supervisors and were like creme de la creme of EV community in, in, in Europe at the time. And also had a luck to recruit some excellent students uh, and uh, I'm very glad to have Edith Putas today. Uh, so I, I, I'm honored to be one of the supervisors of that program so that we can co and cross supervise our students. Uh, and I don't know whether you even noticed, but 
quite a few of students from that network already presented in this mm -hmm. journal club. So first, thanks to Edith for her very subtle, very decisive guidance uh, along the decision making and uh, interpretation of the data that are going to be presented today. And I give word to Danilo and Della. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nat, for this nice introduction and uh, words of wisdom. Uh, I hope now you can see the screen that I'm sharing. So, hello, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for this introduction again. Uh, my name is Danilo Madenovic. I'm a PhD student of Tallinn University, and I also work as a research scientist in Hansa Biomed Life Sciences. Um, Today I will be presenting this article on behalf of all of the authors, and uh, this is the publication that uh, came out earlier this year uh, in the Journal of uh, Thrombostasis and uh, Hemostasis. Uh, and the title of the article is Acidification of Blood Plasma Facilitates Isolation and Analysis of Extracellular Vesicles. So as it was mentioned before, this uh, work was done in collaboration with Samuel University, and uh, uh, that's why we are also having Della uh, today with us, and also my PhD supervisor, Natasha Zarovnik. So before jumping directly into the uh, content of the article, let's make a short recap on the bloodborne EVs and other nanoparticles, just to give the, the context uh, where these uh, studies were coming from and how the, the, the whole article was built. So, Starting from the blood, we already know that the, uh, the, the blood plasma is easily accessible. This is a, a biofluid that is uh, routinely sampled with uh, minimal invasive procedures. This is also the, the one that is well, well established in the diagnostics. And we also know that it is a valuable source of different extracellular vesicles. So uh, which extracellular vesicles would that be? Uh, there are different reports that were tackling this uh, issue to, uh, to define how many different subtypes of uh, EVs we would have in total plasma EV population. And uh, one of such reports from this comput computational and structural biotechnology journal that was published in 2020, uh, which analyzed the EV RNA profile uh, in the blood plasma. Uh, they established that roughly 99.8% of all of the plasma vesicles come from the uh, blood cells, majority actually from the platelets alone, while only uh, this 0.2% were coming from other tissues. And you can already see that this might be problematic if even you're just looking at the total vesicle population in the plasma when you're targeting certain subpopulations or maybe even a rare population, subpopulations that it could be difficult, but that's not the only problem. We also have quite a lot of proteins because plasma is a, is a very rich uh, biofluid. It has roughly 60 to 80 milligrams per milliliter of proteins with the majority of these being albumin. And on top of that, we of course have those lipoproteins which are uh, lipid nanoparticles with a similar size and shape as our vesicle, vesicles, but uh, they can also be quite smaller than EVs. And uh, some of the issues that this uh, uh, poses to our EV research is that lipoproteins are greatly outnumbering vesicles. And not only that, they, they were also reported to carry certain molecules of uh, clinical relevance, which we might uh, falsely attribute them to, to vesicles if we co-isolate them with, uh, with uh, lipoproteins. So just to... to uh, uh, wrap our head around this uh, scale of how much difference, the different concentration of lipoproteins is from the vesicles. The, the lipoproteins actually outnumber EVs by five or six orders of magnitude. So to put it in a perspective that is maybe more intuitive, easier to understand in, in our macro scale world, uh, if you imagine having total plasma nanoparticles as grains of wheat, let's say, and if you would take 1,000 kilogram of these nanoparticles, only around 20 would be representing our vesicles. So that's how big of a difference it is between the lipoproteins and the EVs in terms of the particle number. 
So this already brings the, the question, can we then consider even separating glycoproteins from vesicles? And this is the figure that you all already seen. So uh, if we choose some of the methods that are commonly used to separate by uh, e-vesicles by density or by filtration uh, based on the size, you can always see that there will be uh, some of the lipoprotein subtypes still co-isolating with our vesicles. And not only that issue, we, we also have uh, uh, publications from the, from the Buzash lab that were showing uh, intimate association of lipoproteins with uh, vesicles and that some of the uh, major uh, structural proteins of the lipoprotein particles were also ubiquitous molecules of the EV corona. So uh, we also have these images of uh, uh, crude plasma samples where we could see that some of the larger lipoproteins tend also to fuse with vesicles. So when we take this all information into account and try to answer this question again, you might see that the, the, the answer is uh, highly unlikely. So uh, we, we, we will probably always have certain co-isolation of lipoproteins with our vesicles, even if we uh, choose highest of the purity methods. And most of the methods that we have nowadays are actually always putting the nuts in this seesaw that we have to choose either from purity or yield, and uh, often we, we cannot have both. So in order to summarize some of the problems that, uh, that we have based on this introduction and uh, that uh, regards everyone who works with plasma vesicles, um, I would also like to use here uh, a simple analogy with the game uh, Where's Waldo? And I believe actually that Kent had this uh, uh, similar comparison in his last year's uh, IC presentation. So if that's the case, I give full credits to him for this idea and I, I really uh, hope that he won't mind that I'm reusing it for this slide. So uh, in the game, where's Waldo, you have to find this guy uh, in striped shirt somewhere in the crowd hidden in the picture. So when you translate it to a, uh, an EV picture, if you're trying to find certain vesicles in the total nanoparticle population in the plasma, you might uh, see that it's quite difficult given those LPs that are outnumbering vesicles and that some rare EV populations are very underrepresented. Then in the game, you would probably uh, start making some optimal search path in order to find this folder easier. Uh, and similarity with our, uh, let's say, EV methodologies is that uh, you would also want to have an optimal method, right? So something that would efficiently separate or enrich your vesicles and to do so in a simple and scalable manner and also in, uh, with the reproducibility, right? But often we are actually left with this uh, trade-off of yield versus purity, and that's a big issue. And finally, even if we find the Waldo and uh, it doesn't really look like what we, are, we were expecting, he has these nice decorations all over him and you can see where the similarity goes when we are talking about TVs. Uh, it's about their surface interaction that is uh, very complex, especially in the plasma. So even if you choose the higher purity method, finally, you will have to ask yourself whether the, the, the markers that you're detecting are really uh, EV markers or are they maybe some uh, associated molecules that are part of EV corona. And finally, this is, th these are all the problems and, and some limitations that are also limiting further EV biomarker research and translation to EV-based diagnostic states. And of course, these are some of the uh, problems that we are also facing in our lab and in the research projects that I'm uh, uh, personally involved in, uh, especially because I'm, I'm working with plasma samples often and the common method that I'm using is uh, uh, size exclusion chromatography. So I will just shortly uh, describe the usual workflow that, uh, that I'm applying in, in, in my research projects. Uh, so we would go from the healthy donor plasma that is pre-cleared with two-step centrifugation, the, the common way, and then the plasma would be purified by size exclusion chromatography column. Fractions would be analyzed by NTA or BCA or NBCA to assess the particle and protein concentration. Uh, and for the bulk marker assessment, we would usually use ELISA approach uh, because we just uh, have the uh, exotest plates, which are basically 
the uh, ELISA plates pre-coated with antibodies specific for our vesicles. In this case, I'm using uh, pre-coated with anti-CD9, so the vesicles can be captured on, on top. And then we detect again with uh, anti-CD9 antibody for a signal development. Uh, as for the lipoproteins, I would usually use high binding plate just because it non-specifically absorbs all of the particles on the bottom. And then uh, we can just detect them by a simple antibody against these lipoproteins. In this case, I would mostly resort to using anti apoB And finally, these would be the results that we get with such a workflow. Uh, you would see that particles elute very nicely in the beginning. The uh, protein elution profile is much later, uh, eluting in later fractions. So we have a very nice separation in uh, particles and proteins. We can see based on this ELISA results that sandwich ELISA of CD9 shows this uh, nice correlation between eluted particles and the CD9 positive signal. But the problem is that even with this set purification, we are still left with plenty of those bigger lipoproteins that co-elute with our vesicles. And this is, uh, again, one of those problems that we just recapped. We have high lipoprotein contamination and we have low EV yield. So some of these solutions that we wanted to try out and, and uh, see if, if it had some effects was acidification, and you might wonder why. Well, because in the literature, it was uh, reported that lipoproteins, especially the larger ones, the LDL particles, are sensitive to mild acidic conditions, particularly if they go below pH 6, they get destabilized and disrupted. Also for the major lipoprotein uh, uh, structural protein, ApoB, it goes under remodeling with lowering of the pH, although this is reversible. But for the plasma EVs, we didn't actually have that much data published, although there were reports on EVs from different biofluids that were showing greater pH tolerance in upstream procedures. For example, with uh, urinary EVs, they are uh, easily isolated from, uh, from samples that span pH 4.5 to 8. In the common milk pretreatment procedures, um, they would use pH 4.6. And in some even more extreme conditions uh, for uh, cargo loading of vesicles with the different, I think it was small RNA molecules, uh, they would use pH environment of 2.5. Although there was a, a thing that, that was uh, reported in most of these cases is that acidic environment below pH 5 would show some detrimental effects on the structure. So if we are resorting to acidification in our case, uh, with the plasma samples, then we have to maintain this small window of mild acidic conditions only just to be sure that we won't uh, destroy the vesicles. And also, if we know that EVs have net negative charge, we can expect that lower pH might lead to isoelectric precipitation. So we started with the first experiments to test plasma at different pH levels. Uh, this would be, as I said, in a moderate acidic acidified uh, samples. So the plasma acidified to pH 6, 5.5 and 5, using one molar hydrogen chloride and acidified PBS just to equilibrate it. At the same time, we would use also uh, plasma at pH neutral conditions that is just diluted with the regular PBS. After 30 minutes incubation at 37 degrees, the samples would be uh, centrifuged for five minutes at 300 G. And what we noticed is that at just about pH 5.5, we started getting this precipitation, which would be even more prominent at the lower pH. We would simply separate the uh, upper part of the plasma from the precipitate, the would precipitate in PBS, regular PBS. And in case of pH 7 and pH 6 samples, because we didn't have at least not visible precipitates, we would keep the small amount of plasma from the bottom of the tubes and consider them as our mock precipitates. So the plasma would be further purified by set column, uh, which is equilibrated with the PBS of the same pH as our plasma samples. The fractions collected, uh, the, the fractions containing the vesicles would be uh, pulled and then analyzed on automated Western blot system. 
and the same analysis were done on the precipitates directly to assess the EV and lipoprotein markers. And this was the part also done at the Samuel's University, thanks to Della. So the results that we got from this uh, whole DV set fractions, we could see that with the lowering of the pH, we were getting stronger uh, intensity of the bands for the CD9 analysis uh, just at about pH 5.5, reaching the peak at this pH level. Uh, but we also noticed that APOA1 marker was uh, showing this tendency of increasing the signal uh, with the lowering of the pH. Same was noticed also in these raw precipitate samples. The CD9 was becoming higher in the lower pHs and also for the APOA1 marker. So because at that time we were actually more interested in what's going on with the purified samples, with, with those that were purified with SEC in particular, and the precipitate samples were analyzed, uh, uh, were left for later analysis, we were just uh, choosing the pH 5.5 as our um, optimal pH condition to further explore and study, uh, given that it gave us this strongest peak at CD9 and also the best, uh, uh, I would say, the, 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 the ratio of yield versus the purity. So now we would take, as I said, the pH 5.5 plasma samples, and also always we would have pH 7 as our controls. Uh, and this time we would only work with the precipitate depleted plasma, so the top part that is uh, removed after the, the precipitate. And then the plasma samples would be um, uh, purified by set columns in the same way, but now we would collect all of the fractions and analyze them with ELISA, BCA, and NTA all of them separately just to see um, uh, in a nice resolution uh, analysis how uh, the acidification has an effect on, on all of this uh, on all of these analytical platforms. So in the ELISA, which is this CD9 uh, sandwich ELISA for EVs, which I mentioned in the beginning, we were noticing that at the pH 5.5 in our SEC fractions, we are having again stronger signal, which was significantly higher than pH 7. While for the APOB analysis in the high binding plate uh, ELISA, we were noticing significant depletion of the lipoprotein marker and also this trend to uh, elute in the later fractions. But on the other hand, we also noticed that protein concentration didn't change much. So that was a good thing. We noticed that in those fractions that we have uh, vesicles, we are still getting a very high purity in terms of proteins. And the particle elution profile didn't change. It also very nicely matched the ELISA uh, signal that we were seeing. But what we noticed is that there were some uh, shifts in the uh, uh, some of the fractions where EVs were, uh, shifts in terms of their median size. So our initial hypothesis was that this is due to the um, slight aggregation happening because of these acidic conditions and reaching the isoelectric point. So then we went further and wanted to uh, study the effect of the acidif acidification on plasma, not only on the uh, SEC purified samples, but also involving different common EV uh, isolation methods, such as differential centrifugation. This was also the part that uh, we did at Samuel's University. So the, the, the setup would basically be the same from the beginning. We would start with the plasma that is either acidified or kept at pH neutral conditions. We would separate the plasma from the precipitate. Then the plasma would be purified first by SEC. Then the fractions of, uh, containing EVs were pulled and then subjected to the uh, differential centrifugation at 20,000 G and 100,000 G. Uh, in which way we got this 20k sec pellet and 100k sec pellet. And throughout the whole procedure, again, we were using uh, PBS of the same pH as our plasma samples just to maintain the, the, the same condition from the beginning till the end of isolation. In parallel, we were using the uh, DC only protocol. So the plasma was directly uh, subjected to differential centrifugation. And the same DC only protocol was used for the precipitate sample. So we would get this 20K plasma sample, 20K precipitate sample. 
and also 100k uh, uh, plasma pellet and 100k uh, precipitate pellet. And finally, all of the samples collected were uh, analyzed with close cytometry, with MTA, Western blot, and PEN. Just to recap, this is the table of the samples that we were getting. And the pellets actually looked like this. I thought this is uh, useful to just show you how, how they actually looked like. In pH 5.5, we always saw bigger pellets comparing to the pH 7 samples. Uh, while the uh, 20k pellets actually looked more uh, opaque, the 100k pellets were looking much cleaner. They had this light translucent appearance. So the first analysis done with flow cytometry, this was done on cytoplexes. Uh, the samples of 20k and 100k centrifugation were incubated with anti-CD9 or anti-CD63 fluorescent labeled antibodies. And, um, as controls obviously used our unstained dye only and buffer only. All the events that were detected in our stained samples were normalized using count check bits. And finally, the data was presented as the ratio between the events detected at pH 5.5 versus pH 7. So here you can see the first set of data from the 20K centrifugation here on the y-axis, it's exactly full change over pH 7. And what we can see immediately is that after the 20,000 G centrifugation, SEC uh, samples did not have that uh, big of a difference between two different pH conditions, either for CD9 or CD63. In PDP or plasma samples, we did see a slight increase in the events of the acidic uh, samples and this again goes for both CD9 and CD63. But the biggest difference was actually in the number of events detected in the precipitate at the pH 5.5 compared to its mock pH 7 uh, uh, precipitate control. Uh, here we actually saw almost seven or eight times more events than in the control sample. After 100K centrifugation, the situation was a little bit different. Now we were seeing more events in our SEC 5.5 and plasma 5.5 samples compared to the pH 7 uh, control samples. And this goes for both CD9 and CD63. They were in each case uh, almost three to four times higher uh, than in pH neutral conditions. Similar was observed with uh, particle concentration measurements. We could see that at pH 5.5, we always got more particles. And again, we noticed this uh, median diameter being uh, larger in pH 5.5 samples, which goes in line with our previous hypothesis that uh, this is caused by the aggregation happening at lower pH. So from this, we can, uh, from this data from San Jose University, we can actually draw some, some conclusions that acidification showed increased sedimentation rate during the common uh, centrifugation protocols. And this was again, thanks to the isoelectric precipitation at low pH. The high EV yield was first observed uh, in precipitate after the 20K centrifugation, while after 100K centrifugation, centrifugation the higher EV yield was uh, noticed in the precipitate depleted plasma and the sec fractions. And also the particle count was much higher in those uh, pH 5.5 samples, as well as their median size. And this data was further corroborated with uh, simple Western blunt We could see that again, in, in those acidic conditions, we would get um, uh, much more uh, uh, EV content compared to the pH, uh, pH 7 samples that were loaded in equal volumes. Uh, on the other hand, the pH 5.5 samples were in between each other loaded in the same protein amount. So we could see that for the same amount of proteins, the 100K pellets had more EVs than the 20K samples. And uh, we could see also this in the 10 images of the 20K pellets that indeed they, they, they did have a little bit more uh, proteins co-isolating with them just because of this uh, aggregation happening. 
So because this whole experiment so far were done with plasma, which is, as I said, quite complex biofluid, uh, we still wanted to do control experiments in a, in a simple environment to assess the acidification effect on each of the components individually. So we would run the acidification now on, on just purified vesicles from different source, from the self-conditioned media. And these are again the, the purity standards uh, of, of ours. Or we would use purified lipoproteins that are also commercially available. So I would just prepare the mix of HDL, LDL, and VLDL. And then either of these would be subjected to acidification or keeping them at pH neutral conditions. Uh, for that, we were using just PBS of different pH levels. So in this uh, simple, let's say, uh, solution, we did not observe precipitate forming after same incubation and centrifugation protocol, meaning that the precipitate is something more typical for the plasma, which is more complex biofluid. And uh, nevertheless, we still took the sample and purified it with SEC and analyzed the EV fractions just to see uh, what is happening with, uh, with, uh, with either of these components when, when they are purified, when they are acidified uh, alone and separately. So in the ELISA, uh, which was the same sandwich ELISA for EVs, we could see that the uh, signal was basically the same between the two pH conditions, although the uh, acidic samples were uh, tending to elute a bit earlier. This also reflected on the particle uh, elution profile, so we could see more particles coming out in the first fractions, but overall we could see that signal is the same, the total particles recovered were the same, so uh, we can conclude that the acidification of pure EVs uh, does not have the same effect as in uh, plasma. It doesn't uh, affect them either negatively nor positively. It just uh, behaves in the same way uh, in, in either of the conditions. But with lipoproteins, it was a bit different. We did see the, the disturbances in the elution of the lipoproteins for both APOB and APOA markers in ELISA. This was similar, although not as consistent as in plasma samples. And we did notice that these disturbances were also, note, uh, were also reflecting on the particle elution profile. So less particles eluted in the acidified lipoprotein sample. And when we look in the total particles recovered, this was showing uh, around 60% uh, reduction of lipoproteins in the fraction where we would usually expect to have our EVs. Uh, the next question that we wanted to address is how many vesicles we actually could have in the plasma precipitate. If we just do this uh, simple 300 G five minute centrifugation, so how many vesicles end up in this immediate precipitate? For this, we took once more uh, purified vesicles and labeled them with uh, uh, CFSC. So these were, uh, just to make it clear, the, the vesicles from the cell condition media uh, labeled with CFSC and purified from the excess dye using SEC. And then those fluorescently labeled vesicles would be spiked into the plasma that was subjected to the same pH procedure as before. And now the uh, precipitate is separated from the plasma. And we directly analyze those samples for uh, fluorescence redistribution using plate reader or fluorescent MTA, just to see the bulk fluorescence or the fluorescence on the single particle level. As a blind control, we used non-spike plasma just to make sure that there is no autofluorescence coming from these samples. And the results were quite interesting. So what we could see is that at pH 5.5 precipitate and pH 7 mock precipitate, we basically have the same protein concentration and similar particle, total particle concentration, but there was a huge difference between the uh, concentration of the fluorescent particles. Much more particles, uh, fluorescent EVs were present in the precipitate at 5.5, and we, when we transfer this into the percentage of the actual recovered uh, fluorescent TVs, we can see that 
the pH 5.5 precipitate uh, was able to recover up to 20% 20, 20 of total spike fluorescent PVs, while in our um, mock precipitate, we were just getting around 1% or 2% of those spiked fluor EVs. So with this, I would like to conclude that uh, moderate plasma acidification enriches plasma EVs with both SEC and DC as common EV isolation protocols, uh, while it also improves the EV LP ratio. At the same time, this higher sedimentation rate of EVs in low pH facilitates the downstream analysis, especially if the um, method that we are using is of low sensitivity. The immediate precipitation at pH 5.5 enables rapid recovery of up to 20% of EVs. And all in all, this is a simple and inexpensive, but still high gaming technique that could have potential impact on, on uh, any future EV-based biomarker studies. And with this, I would like to finish the presentation and thank to our uh, authors from Samuelweis University, to Galeran Kamari and Professor Dr. Eddie Buzash, and also uh, Dr. Agnes Kittel from Institute of Experimental Medicine, who uh, uh, performed the TAM imaging for us. Thank you all for your attention. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, let me just, all right. <laughs> That was a lot of work. Congratulations. <laughs> um, so we do have a um, couple of questions in the chat box, uh, and I'm giving the audience some time to put uh, even more. Uh, and perhaps I can ask uh, one question to start with. Um, during your presentation, I was wondering if you tested any other apolipoproteins for the ELISA assay, or um, you just did apo was it apolipoprotein B that you did yeah, for the laser? Yes. Yeah, Most and how this will affect uh, the um, the outcome? So uh, we used mostly ApoB because this is the marker of larger lipoproteins, which we would expect to have more, at least in those sec purified samples, and uh, the one that we are expecting to be affected more by acidification based on the literature. We did use also ApoA. Uh, mm -hmm. as a marker of smaller HDL uh, uh, lip lipoproteins, but it was actually not that present in the EV sec fractions. You can also see it from these uh, slides. I can show. So from the part where we did it on the, on the purified lipoproteins, you can see that actually not much elutes in the beginning as much as it looks later. So the same situation would be with plasma. And also another issue is that uh, APOA1 is one of those ubiquitous uh, molecules of EV protein corona. So in, in this case, it, it might be a bit difficult to claim whether it's from HDL or is it a part of this EV protein corona. Yeah, so that's why we were mostly using APOA1. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's jump into the, the chat box then. Uh, Minglin, um, you had a question, and I believe now, yes, I allowed unmuting and starting videos. Uh, yes, uh, Perfect. yeah, I put a question in the in, in the chat. So, uh, very good, uh, great work, and uh, this uh, would be helpful for isolation the EVs for detection the numbers. Now, the question is. Uh, in a lot of scenario, we uh, isolate EVs to detect the bioactive function of those EVs, or even you know incubate with the uh, with the cells for you know detection the bioactive molecules uh, uh, carried by the EVs. Now the question is, uh, if the acidified acidification uh, this method isolates EVs affect uh, the bioactive function. Thank you. That, that's, that's an excellent question. And, and we've been asked this before as well. So the, uh, we did not really assess the functionality of these vesicles because our primary goal was to enrich vesicles for the reason of detecting the biomarkers, not for any functional application later on or, or uh, functional assays in general. Uh, it might be a bit difficult to speculate now how, how the acidification would affect the, the, the EV's functionality because 
it, it probably depends on the on the molecules of uh, that that would uh, convey this uh, this functional property and if the ph 5.5 is harsh enough environment to denature this protein we could see that uh, in most of these cases, for example, let, let's let's take this one that uh, that was using actually the uh, vesicles to, uh, loading in the pH 2.5, which I mentioned in the beginning. So in this article, uh, we could see that HEC 293 EVs were loaded with different RNA molecules at pH 2.5, and they did report that after that EVs were still uh, uh, taken up by the recipient cells efficiently, so it didn't affect the uh, uptake. So it probably didn't affect like too much. It didn't interrupt the, the 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 vesicle composition that much that it could be useless after that. So I, I yeah, think the pH 5.5 wouldn't wouldn't have that much of a difference. Yeah, probably uh, this uh, as uh, acidify. Uh... The, fun, uh, the the environment does not affect the proteins uh, which are resistant to the you know a low pH, but for certain uh, molecules which is uh, sensitive to the to the low pH uh, or acidified uh, mm -hmm. conditions, those might be affected by this process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that's an excellent comment. But as you mentioned. Um, I think one needs to adapt the basically the rationale behind acidification on the question, the scientific question. And since here the biomarkers were the targets, um, perhaps it was not that harmful. But have you been able to check that actually, like to have any um, imaging based experiment to see if uh, the membranes of the EVs or the protein corona was not uh, affected that much other than the western blotting that you showed we did have just this PEM imaging mm -hmm. for which we could see that uh, the uh, vesicles were still there although they didn't definitely look that nice as a ph uh, 7 uh, but we could still see the, the preser preserved uh, uh, shape and, and size ranges of EVs that we would usually expect. So we just probably have uh, also quite some proteins, at least in these 20k samples that were probably a bit dirtier than, than the 100k uh, uh, sensitive samples. But other than this, we did not do any additional imaging. Sounds good. All right. So the next per, uh, next question is from Charlotte. Charlotte, are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right. Hi. Perfect. Uh, Hi. <laughs> yes. So I'm Charlotte Poulon from uh, IRSET in Brittany in France. Uh, I had a very simple question. It was just to know if the plasma you tested was fresh plasma or frozen plasma. And if you have a, if you didn't test frozen plasma, if you have an idea if it would affect uh, your results. Most of the time, actually, we use frozen plasma. Uh, mm -hmm. So, especially in this case, we were using the plasma from the biobank. So, we would usually purchase a, a bigger batch of the full plasma samples. Um, okay, great. Mm -hmm. I did notice exactly that that with samples that were maybe more fresh, the precipitation would be uh, uh, better, and the signal would be higher. But for some of the plasma samples that were maybe longer in the minus 80 storage, then I would notice that the effect is not as pronounced. And also, in general, I would see that the tree signalizes signal. Okay. And, and you didn't mention, I think, the condition uh, that were used to isolate the plasma, the, the centrifugation that were applied. You said there were two centrifugations, but you didn't say which one. Oh, I missed it. The, the the 20k uh sorry no the initial one to isolate the plasma is it ah, uh, the, uh, uh you mean plasma from the precipitate or no the just from blood how ah, you sorry, isolate yeah, yeah because this was this was coming again from the biobank so they do the uh, uh mm -hmm. certification yes. which was i think this 2500g for 15 or 20 minutes Okay. And then I will perform additional centrifugation when I receive the plasma before alley coating it and, and storing it at minus 80. So it's a double step centrifugation 
with this uh, 2500 G for uh, 20 minutes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question was actually addressed directly to me. So perhaps this was uh, just a mistake. So Aled, if you don't mind uh, unmuting and share your questions with the audience, if you are still here, otherwise I can just read them. All right. So basically the question was, um, was there any morphology changes in EM induced by acids such as change in vesicle shape, membrane integrity, uh, complexation with other element, and I think you just <laughs> you just answered this question. Um, and the second one, in your isolation, you kept the buffer acidic. Did you ever allow, did you ever allow a re-neutralization of the pH? Um, and if so, did this have any advantages that of what you have shown so far? So basically. Um, doing the the opposite acidification and then neutralization and see how yes. this may affect yes. the results so, yeah sorry i i probably missed that information yeah. in, the, in the presentation but usually yes in the end of the isolation procedure the pellets that we would get would be resuspended in the regular pbs so i didn't measure yeah, actually the, the pH in those brush shoes uh, in the sweater okay Someone unmuted by mistake. Sorry about yeah. that. Uh, in, indeed, like just to answer the question, it, uh, in the end, the samples were resuspended in the regular PBS just to uh, uh, prevent any further, maybe like prolonged exposure to acidic conditions that could be detrimental to EVs. Yeah. Um, and then the next person asking a question was Katrin. Katrin, are you here? Hi, I'm here. Cool. Um, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I have two, but I'll just ask the one. Um, it's the methods question. I was wondering um, when you were doing the EV spiking with the CFSE um, into the lower pH, uh, how did you control for the natural depression of the fluorescent signal? Because as far as I know, CFSE is very sensitive to pH changes. So how were you able to control for that? Exactly. So th this is a great question. Thank you for, for asking it. Uh, the CFSC vesicles that were stained and spiked into the plasma samples, and finally, when we get the precipitate and the plasma, we would dilute the sample in the regular PBS before the measurements. So finally, the, both of these conditions would be neutralized in our analytical process. So then all of these uh, uh, effects that pH might have on CFSC are actually abolished, or at least we, we didn't see the, the effect. Okay, thanks. Um, so my other question was in regards to the Western blotting, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding it, but there seems to be more CD9 in both the precipitate and in the um, precipitate-free plasma. Uh, the other one with the West. Ah, sorry, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so there seems to be more CD9 in both of, of the fractions, but I'm wondering um, if, like, why, why would there be more uh, compared to the neutral for both of the fractions? Is this like there's, there's more CD9 in general mm -hmm. um, in the lower pH? Why is there that dramatic signal? I would expect it to be like if there was <clears throat> more CD9 in the precipitate, there would be less of it in. Uh, the the rest of the fraction or vice versa. Yes, yes, exactly. So for the precipitate, at least we can uh, uh, say that based on the last experiment where we saw that in the precipitate we get actually enrichment of the vesicles, then we would expect this enrichment to also reflect here, right? So according to the raw plasma sample that is in this case P7 or the mock precipitate, we should see actually this increase, right? In the last experiment, we showed this uh, at 20 percent uh, of vesicles being uh, uh, preferentially enriched in the precipitate of the pH 5.5. While for the sec fractions, well, here it's a, it's, it's a little bit difficult because um, what we were speculating is that the since there are also smaller vesicles in the plasma sample, which usually get lost in the sec fractions. Uh, we are probably being able to recover them better now just because of this aggregation happening. 
So that's why we would see them not only here increasing, but also in, in general ELISA assays that we were performing in these uh, SAC fractions. So in the SAC, they would uh, increase just because of this uh, precipitation and aggregation happening. And in the precipitate, it's only because of the precipitation. And uh, to answer whether we should expect to have less or more, well, um, it's probably also the, the fact that we are still not getting all of the vesicles from our samples. So it just happens that the acidification enables uh, this uh, analysis uh, in, in both of the conditions without actually acquiring any, any uh, new vesicles. It just like helps to recover those that are already present in, in the sample. Okay, so you're saying that the that there, there's the ability to collect more EVs when you do SEC um, with the acidic um, environment, correct? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the, the last part. You're saying that by acidifying the environment, you're able to collect more EVs in the SEC fractions. Is that uh, what you're saying? Yes, yes, that should be one. Okay, thanks. Yep. And since we have this uh, blot up, uh, Mingling um, made a comment here saying that the APO A1 with isolated EV seems to increase um, when the uh, acidification occurs. And I think this is uh, relative to the lower, um, I mean, right lower corner uh, Western blot. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah. yeah, well, in both of the cases, it actually happens. and. Uh, and, and this is also why I made the comment later that the APOA1, although it's considered an HDL marker, we can also consider it as an EV corona marker. So it's difficult to say whether this enrichment comes because of the HDL or because it's associated to vesicles that we are also seeing here in, in increased in the, in the same precipitate. Oh yeah, you have mentioned that during your presentation. That's correct. All right. So next we have uh, Philip asking us. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi. With a comment on functional analysis and what is required to do such experiment. Go ahead. Uh, well, in, in in all instances where one is looking for greater production uh, or isolation of EVs. Um, in the end, it's required to test their function, both in vitro and in vivo. And when doing so, one must be uh, very careful to do dose response of the function in comparison, in comparing, let's say, the acidified or the non-acidified, etc. cetera. Um, this is a pretty ultimate comparison of what I think is the most important important uh, aspect of the EVs is their actual function and uh, function in a dose response experiment. Yeah, and I believe Natasha already kind of had a, a chat here, so please feel free to unmute and uh, share your comments with the audience. No, I actually, I, I fully agree. I mean, this is something that is so uh, missed so in so many claims on function, okay. Uh, here, uh, we actually work on, um, as I mentioned at, at the beginning, I think that the challenge fronted here was more with uh, some sort of a diagnostic application in mind than functional. And it also goes along with the volumes used and types of samples used. Now we know that blood is also uh, a source of vesicles that are very functional. I mean, there are a lot of people studying that. Uh, so how to harvest uh, vesicles from blood and use them for their functionality. And I would also say that functionality can also be of diagnostic uh, importance, right? But uh, the, the, the thing is that as Danilo said, we actually did not assess the function uh, of these particular vesicles. We played with the pH on different types of vesicles, never the blood-borne ones. And we know that pH affects uh, function in a quite paradoxical ways. As I say, sometimes you get to even increase 
of function of some moieties, like enzymes. I mean, there are enzymes that get more active if you uh, uh, lower or, you know, put higher pH. This is an excellent uh, suggestion. I'm not sure that uh, even, you know, involved in this work, I would actually recommend to introduce acidification to increase the yield of vesicles that are obtained from blood for the sake of using them as functional effectors, right? So I have to think about that. I, I would not go that far. I think that there are better ways and more physiological ways to keep them nice, happy, and active. But this is definitely something that, uh, I mean, my worry is that in case of blood, we would just create artifacts, positive or negative artifacts. That would not be their physiological function, not at 5.5 we can reconstitute normal pH and we know that vesicles recover excellently. So they practically go well, like 90, 95% of prior functionality for other than blood. So that's my comment, but very intriguing. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's actually really interesting to see all the possibilities here and all the, the, the application. Um, and the last question we had in the chat is from uh, Patricia, but the question was about the integrity of EV membrane and whether the uh, acidification uh, can induce some lysis of EVs. Oh, here she is. Hi. Yes, yes I'm here. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I suppose that um, the, the best uh, buffer to 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 have the the AVs uh, is PBS or there is some publication that with the other other um, other things uh, aggregated, but uh, to 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 avoid the ly lysis of AVs, uh, I was always tried not to change so much the the PBS. So, what do you think about uh, acidification? It's I know that it's not uh, in the in in the direction of your result because if you have lysis of EPs, you you wouldn't have uh, later uh, an increase in of your EPs. But um, what do you think about this? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. It's it's an obviously a valid concern and. Uh, uh, I would just make a couple of comments on this. So starting from the literature, first we could see that the uh, even lower acidic environments were used in different EV uh, uh, sources. But in this particular case, why, why we think that the vesicles are not affected uh, by the uh, pH 5.5 is just because it's not as harsh pH environment as some of the reported ones here. And also because, for example, in our ELISA assessments, as I said, this is uh, sandwich ELISA. So it relies on the um, one vesicles being attached and then the, uh, with one antibody and then detected with, with another one on top. So they would have to have a certain integrity for that. And also if they were lysed, they would not elute in the earlier fractions, they would elute uh, later with the protein fractions uh, showing that they were fragmented basically or, or destroyed. And this was not the case here. And also with NTA, we could see that they were maintaining similar or even larger size compared to the pH seven samples. So this is all going in line that, that integrity is maintained. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. And I would urge Thank everyone you. to perhaps watch the journal club uh, session about uh, EVs and different buffer from Andre uh, publication in JAV. Um, actually, PBS didn't really well perform based on the results from this paper. Mm -hmm. So uh, you may want to have a look to that. Um, and we actually arrive at the uh, the hour, um, but perhaps like if um, the mentors, Edith or Natasha have any final comment, please feel free um, to, to make it. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for Danilo and Della. Uh, that was really fantastic, uh, John Cup session. But yeah, please, Edith and Natasha, if you have any yeah. burning last comments, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Danilo.
Oh. Edith wants to say something. Uh, yeah, but she's mute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as, as no. I said, yeah. Here. Uh, go. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I think the the presenter Danilo uh, presented the results really well, and I I have nothing to add. So thanks, Danilo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Edith. Thank you, Danilo. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you again for uh, Danilo and Della for this uh, beautiful paper and for the mentors to attend the session. We really enjoyed it, and see you soon. Bye. Yeah.